Well, today we're preaching from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, and we'll be preaching out of Matthew chapter 19. What I mean by that is we've got a subject that we're looking at in Matthew, uh, in Mark chapter 10, but it's elaborated on more in Matthew 19, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, as we've been going through Mark's Gospel, um, we have been discovering again and again that Jesus takes on the challenging conversations. And he often takes them on by virtue of people coming to him and confronting him with uh, really hard, hard questions. Difficult questions that usually the religious community has been wrestling with itself for a long time. Maybe over decades, maybe even over centuries. Just the hard questions of, of why, what and how. And this morning we've come to one of those very, very deep and important questions. And it's about uh, marriage and divorce. Marriage and divorce. This, morning, uh, this week when I was uh, doing my preparation, Michaela, my wife, sent me a text saying, how are you doing, Craig? And I text back and I said, well, not so good, I'm contemplating divorce. And uh, she, was, uh, she was with some people at the time and she knew what I was on about, but um, uh, she managed to share that with others and cause them to gasp in horror. But it wasn't uh, for any more than um, a moment, my, my strange sense of humour. So today we're going to be talking about something that is very deep and dear to, to numbers of people, not only because you may have self-experienced a broken marriage, but maybe there are people in your family who have, maybe it's been parents, maybe it's brothers and sisters or close friends who have gone through this very, very difficult time. Um, I suppose for me it's been a challenge pr- putting this together because there is a variety of ways in which we can approach this, and I'm trying to approach it from the most biblical perspective that I can generate. I've pulled in a lot of commentators, a lot of voices into my head over the last few weeks as I've been anticipating this. Uh, One of those who's really spoken to me about this has been Andy Stanley. Many of you will have heard of Andy Stanley. He's a very well-known speaker and he's in North Point Church in Atlanta. And the reason why I was very interested in what he had to say was because uh, his father is Charles Stanley. Charles is on television quite often and... um, Charles Stanley and his wife actually had a divorce. And so therefore, Andy Stanley, as his child, uh, reflecting on his own parents' uh, journey through this very, very difficult time, I know would have drilled down and given this a tremendous amount of thought. I'm in a situation, thankfully, where next year I'll be married 30 years. Uh, My parents on my side of the family and Michaela's side of the family and grandparents all the way through, um, there haven't been any divorces in our family. And so I receive that as a blessing. Uh, So therefore, I don't know personally those tensions of uh, divorce, separation, etc. I'm not saying here that all of those marriages were idealistic or perfect. I'm sure some of them were good old tough Kiwi marriages, which sort of went, you know, I told you I loved you once. If I change your mind, I'll tell you again. You know, I'll tell you you if it's changed, you know. Um, But uh, such as it was uh, in the day. Uh, the other thing I could do in titling, this, uh, t- in titling this sermon a little bit differently would be to say that this is uh, a conversation with my son, because my son, Taylor, he gets married next weekend. And so uh, this conversation is one of those conversations that you have over time. You don't sit down necessarily and just line up uh, a, big, a big cannon full of information for your son. Usually you have empowered the conversation over years. Uh, by demonstration, and by giving, peop- giving your children the understanding of what marriage is about. But uh, next week, I'll be up here on Saturday, uh, taking my son and his fiancée, Amy, through their marriage vows. Very, very special time, very important occasion. So um, whilst this isn't a picture of them, this is something of what we're going to experience next week. Now, what I want to do this morning is uh, I'm going to lead to... Lead to a position of grace. But to understand grace, we need to understand truth. And to understand truth, we have to dive back into Scripture and understand the story of how God created marriage and what marriage was designed for, and then we get to the words of Jesus himself. So if we go back into Genesis, we find that uh, God created male and female, and here we find these words. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
And the most important thing to note here, not apart from the created side of this conversation, is that God made male and female in his image. When he was creating male and female, men and women, he said, what shall they look like? Well, they can look like a male and a female, but together they will look like me. And so he created us to be one and to carry the image, to be carrying the image, the burden of the image of Christ, of God himself. Um, later on in Genesis chapter 2, it says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. The whole understanding here is that marriage was God's original idea. It wasn't created by us. It was created by God. It's not given to just one faith. It's given to all of creation. So marriage is a creation ordinance. It's given to all of us in such a way that we can be created in God's image and then aligned together to be one both physically, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually. At every level, we're created to be one male and female together as a marriage. And so this is a very important thing to recognize right at the beginning. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, this is a little bit further on, I haven't put the text up here, uh, there's a time and a season and a place when the nation of Israel was really, really struggling with this whole understanding of marriage. And Moses, who was the leader of the nation of Israel at the time, said, if you're going to divorce or separate yourself from your spouse, then you had to issue your wife with a certificate of divorce. Now, this was a very patriarchal community, which meant that the male was the boss. And if it was his decision to end the marriage, then he had to do so legitimately, i.e. not just cast somebody out or just abandon them in some fashion, stop providing for them, but what the man had to do was write out a writ of divorce to formally end that relationship. And by doing so, this actually gave the woman some freedoms, freedom to go back to her family, freedom to remarry. But a lot of this was done out of the hardness of a man's heart. And Jesus is going to pick up on this in a little while. But out of the hardness of the man's heart, this became a real problem within the society. And Malachi, the, the final prophet in the Old Testament, said this to the nation of Israel. He said, another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears, you weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offering or accepts them with pleasure from your hands. You ask, why? It is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. So those are very powerful words, aren't they? Very powerful words, particularly when you're talking about here the, 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 the spouse, the wife, in our case today, the wife, the husband of your youth, the covenant that was made. And when you hate upon that person, you bring violence into the home. Not necessarily physical violence, but uh, this violence here is talked about is uh, the very reason why God hates divorce. Because it is such a traumatic time that it can be akin to nothing else than violence as a relationship that is violence in the home. Now, today we're going to be talking about marriage from the perspective that Jesus brings to it. Um, it's a very tight and a very very uh, disciplined look at this understanding of marriage and divorce. I realize right up front that there have been people here who have been divorced and remarried. I'll, I'll be speaking to you, but I won't be talking to you in context of saying if you've escaped your marriage because of violence or abandonment of some sort, I'm saying that um, that, that sort of thing legitimizes uh, a relationship breakdown. Those are the things that I don't want to be accused of being hard-hearted towards myself here today. But we need to look at what it was that drove Jesus to talk about marriage in such a way that uh, made him really, really tight about what marriage is and what marriage isn't, and particularly in this case, what divorce is and what divorce isn't. So the first thing we've got to do is put ourselves back into the Gospels, and we've got to realize that the Pharisees were testing Jesus. They were always testing Jesus. 
They were always trying to catch him out. They were always trying to put him in a predicament where he would violate some Old Testament covenant code that would then immediately allow them to say, see, I told you he's a heretic and we should stone him to death. The Pharisees were trying to position Jesus in such a way they would win and Jesus would lose. So what's going on here? What's going on here? The first thing is that, um, that, that the Pharisees held on to was a belief that divorce is okay for any reason. Now, when I say any reason, I mean any reason. Uh, there were cases of divorce where literally the wife burnt the dinner. Out you go, here's your divorce, gone. Okay, it was not an uncommon thing for a man to divorce his wife because the neighbours could hear her yelling at him. Okay, maybe he needed a good yelling. But uh, right out, divorce. And what we're saying here is that because Moses allowed for divorce, the nation of Israel had become familiar with divorce, and divorce was now becoming so familiar for any reason. And then there were the Pharisees who actually um, thought a little bit more about this, this context and said, hey, look, divorce is possible because Moses said it was, but maybe only for particular reasons, like marital unfaithfulness, or maybe if your wife didn't produce a son. You know, there was a big deal about being able to produce an heir, Maybe that was a legitimate reason to divorce your wife. And so all these reasons were being pushed up, stacked up against Jesus. And Jesus was being pressured here to define what it is that marriage was or wasn't. So let's jump into Matthew chapter 19. I say we've been studying through Mark, but Matthew 19 gives a more thorough look at this very sensitive subject. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and he went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Notice the any and every. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made male and female, made the male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So immediately we've got a change and a challenge. The challenge is going directly back to the Pharisees who thought that you could divorce for every and any reason. Jesus is raising the bar and he's saying, look, back in the beginning, God brought male and female together. And if God has brought them together, then no one shall bring about a separation of that. So Jesus is saying they are one flesh. Jesus is saying that if they've been brought together, man shouldn't separate what God has already put together. And what Jesus is saying here is that God owns marriage. God owns marriage. It's called a covenant relationship. And in a covenant relationship, God is involved in the midst of that covenant. You know, particularly when we talk about a religious ceremony, a Christian wedding, you know, when we invoke God's blessing upon this. And there the tension arises for us in today's society because there is a very flippant uh, look at marriage happening. You know, people take a, I'm in, I'm out. If it works for me, it's okay. If it doesn't, I'm out of here sort of attitude. And that's the difference between a covenant and a partnership. A covenant is binding. It's irrevocable. You can't have a covenant and break out of it. Because by nature, a covenant can't be broken out of. God made covenants with us through, through Abraham, through Moses, through Noah, and ultimately through Jesus Christ. These are covenants that can't be broken. A partnership is completely different to that. It's a relationship of convenience. And as a relationship of convenience, it means that if it doesn't work for you, then, we're, then, then, then you can get out. If it doesn't work for me, then I can get out. You know, maybe it's a business partnership type deal where we can say, look, if we're not making any money or you're not pulling your weight, we can break this off. But socially, in the context of relationships, um, this was never designed to be the way that marriage works. And we see how covenant impacts the wedding ceremony itself, don't we? Like when you meet together with people to see their marriage vows being made, you come and you listen and there's a level of sincerity and honesty and hope there that is um, being relayed by the couple. I know whenever I'm sitting in a marriage ceremony and uh, I'm not officiating, I'll hold my wife's hand when the couple make their vows because I'm like, 
yeah, remember we did this? Yeah, remember how important that was to us? And, and these words are very important to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until death do us part. And uh, that's covenant word. Those are covenant words, aren't they? They really are. Um, partnership type words would be uh, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or not so bad, for richer and I don't want to get really poor, and sickness, mm, yeah, maybe the flu, and in health, and to love and to cherish until, well, maybe we might die, but we might get bored of this anyway. That would be a partnership relationship. It's about two people looking at this for mutual convenience. This is completely different to covenant. So let's have a look at what Jesus had to say in this ongoing discussion with the Pharisees. Jesus said, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Okay, so God has joined them together. You can get an, an annulment, you could get a divorce, but God still says, I am above and beyond the law. Therefore, what I have created and you have covenanted before me is even more powerful than a writ of divorce or an annulment. Now, that's going to shake us up a little bit, but that's what Jesus said here. And then he goes on to say this. Why, sorry, they want to say, Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give a wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Good question. You know, if God's all into keeping people together, why did he give Moses permission to give people permission to divorce their spouse, divorce their wife in this case? And uh, it's a very good question. And the Pharisees are trying to push Jesus on this, to get Jesus to say, Oh, Moses got it wrong. And the moment Jesus said Moses got it wrong, they would have pulled their two-pound stones out of their back pocket and they would have been into him because that's all they were looking for was an opportunity to get rid of this guy. But Jesus had a few more clues and that being God is kind of helpful. And he said this, and Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. Your hearts were hard. In other words, it wasn't God's fault that he had to create divorce, but at the end of the day, he created divorce to allow people to actually legitimize something that God never wanted in the first place, but it made better a bad situation. So in other words, instead of a woman just being hated upon, a woman being abandoned, and having no real sense of belonging, particularly to the husband of her youth who essentially abandoned her, and now doesn't like it, at least she had a, 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 an end to this relationship that was just not working. And she could go back legitimately to her family, extended family, and she would find a place there. But without that, she was sort of uh, persona non grata, you know, a person without a home, a person without a place. And therefore, that was a really difficult place for her to be. So when Moses said, you know, give, them a, give her a divorce, that was never meant to be a license just to say, you burnt the toast, you're out of here. But because these men were hardening their hearts, and they weren't protecting themselves as the scriptures had already told us they should. Here it is, we go back to this word in Malachi again. It says that the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Those final words that say, so be on your guard, more literally say, guard your heart. Guard your heart and don't be unfaithful. And it's the guarding of our heart is really, really the important thing here because it's in the hardening of our heart that these problems begin. You know, the self-talk that just says, oh, gosh, I think this is over. Oh, gosh, I'm not going to tell her this, but, uh, man, I don't like the way she cooks anymore. I don't like the way she looks anymore. I don't like the way she drives anymore. I, don't li I can't divorce a wife for the way she drives, by the way. But you will find a hardening of your heart. That is what is being protected here. That's what we're asked to be protective of, is the, the self-talk, the little patter and chatter that goes on in your heart. And so it's really important to remember that. So back to what Jesus' conversation was about. And, uh, and now he starts to raise the game, raise the bar. And it's here where it starts to get really serious 
for the Pharisees who are listening because Jesus has pushed back on their understanding of marriage. He's saying, listen, this idea that you can divorce anybody at any time, says, it's rubbish. God never intended that in the first place. Okay, So here Jesus is bringing back what was supposedly the, the right idea that God wanted in the first instance. And he says here, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Commits adultery. Wow. The Pharisees in the day would have been, whoa. Well, hold on, hold on. We've got friends who have divorced their spouses for different reasons, for any and every reason. And now you're telling us that when they got remarried, they were committing adultery? That's what Jesus is saying. And why is Jesus saying this? Why? Because Jesus was wanting to take what has become a custom of divorce and remarriage, a tradition of divorce and remarriage, just something that is seen as normal everyday life, divorce and remarriage, uh, essentially serial monogamy. You know what I mean by serial monogamy? In other words, just a series of uh, monogamous relationships, one man, one woman, leave that woman behind, get another woman, another one, another one. Not polygamy where you got wives all same time, but monogamy. Saying that is illegitimate. That's not the way God wants it to happen. And he puts an abrupt end to this. And in doing this, he creates a whole new understanding that refreshes what marriage is actually about. So, now we've got a problem here. We've got a problem even in this room. Because there are people here who have experienced divorce and experienced remarriage. And so what Jesus is actually saying to people who have entered into a marriage when there hasn't, sorry, ended a marriage and then entered into another one when there hasn't been marital unfaithfulness in the first marriage, what Jesus is saying here is that there is uh, adultery occurring here. And we start to feel this word here, the gravitas, this word gravity. And if you're starting to feel this weight, this solemnity on you right now, well, you're starting to get what it is that the Pharisees were feeling when they listened to Jesus. And the reason why Jesus wanted them to feel that, and he wants us to feel that, is because we need to understand afresh and to refresh ourselves with just how vitally important this marriage covenant actually is. Because in today's society, we can have a very Hollywood view of marriage. We, marriage, we marry for convenience. We marry because it's just cool to do so. We just get drawn into that convention of marriage. And there we can feel if it's easy come, it's easy go. We can just get out of it again. Pretty much that rock star mentality pervades society today. You know, as soon as it feels uncomfortable, the whole partnership deal kicks in and we're gone. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who work really, really hard at their marriages and they're really, really uh, committed to them. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those who take a flippant view of marriage. But what Jesus is saying here captures also those who he was with, his disciples. They feel the gravitas. They feel the weight, the solemnity, the gravity of the situation as well. When they pick up on the conversation, it says this. Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Exactly. Exactly. That's what Jesus would have been implying all the way through. He's saying, look, don't take this marriage covenant lightly. My son's been engaged for three years. And we've had this conversation for three years. You know what you're doing, mate? Yep, I'm in love. You're in love for the right reasons? Yep, what's that? And he explained to me. You know, the first time he ever talked to me, I shouldn't say this, about his girlfriend, because they started going out in high school, okay? Sixth form, year 12. He says, oh, you met Amy? She is beautiful, eh? <laughs> and I've had him on it saying, hey, she's beautiful, but there's more to it than that, isn't there? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I've been pushing him, pushing him. What is it that you understand about this relationship? What is it that you understand about this marriage thing? 
You know, it's important, isn't it? It's for life. You're going to live together, love together, and you will change together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're trying to um, help him understand this. But the disciples here caught on to the fact that Jesus is saying, look, unless you are absolutely convinced and committed to doing it well, then just keep clear of making those vows, those covenant vows. Then Jesus takes it up another notch. If you're thinking, gosh, is there enough notches there to take it up? Well, there's some more to go. And he says this. Uh, I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. Now, eunuchs mean, essentially meaning those who don't have any, uh, any, any sexual life at all, okay? Either because they've been castrated or because they choose to live in that fashion and not have any sexual activity in their lives. And twice Jesus says, if the situ- uh, twice says not everyone, he says not everyone can accept this. What he's saying is that if you are called to this, then you stick with this. Not everyone can do this. But if you're called to it, you stick with it because it's a calling. To be single is a calling, and it's an honoring, God-honoring calling. So it's not something to be ashamed of or disappointed in, but it's something that God has ordained. If, you, if you're called that way, you accept it with absolute confidence, and you praise God because you've been called to live in this fashion, and you've been given the grace to do so. Unlike others that the Apostle Paul talked about, who said, it's better to be single, but if you burn with passion, if you burn with passion, it's better to get married. Better to get married. Okay, so you're not called to be single. You, 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 need, the, you, know, you need that uh, companionship, and you want to break out of loneliness. But for others, it's a gift of being on their own. So, where does that leave us? It's a real hard word from Jesus, isn't it? Because we're staring down the barrel of what he says to people who have had a broken marriage and then they enter into another marriage, he's saying, that's adultery. And we can't actually find a way to escape this. And here's the tension. Because the tension is going to create a situation in us where we have to discover and rediscover the grace of God. Because what I hear, and as you would have heard many times speaking to people who have gone through a divorce, is you would have heard stories that say, the person that they were living with, the, the spouse that they had, uh, was a very, very difficult person to live with. They might have been really uh, angry or abusive or just didn't provide or was selfish. And then you also hear that the story from that side of the, other, of the argument is one of minimizing. You know, my role was really minimal. I was just the victim in all of this and couldn't help it. I did everything I could, but it didn't happen. And so you get these, this justification going on, this reasoning going on, this rationalization of what the relationship was and why it had to end. Jesus says there's another way to reconcile all of this. There's another way. And I want to tell you a little made-up story to help you understand what I'm driving towards here. There was a man who was caught stealing some bread, and he was brought to the judge. The judge looked at him, and said, are you a thief? Did you steal the bread? And he goes, sir, my family hasn't eaten food for, for over a week. They're starving. They can't go to school. They've got no energy. And, he goes, and the judge says, listen, I'm just asking you a simple question. Are you a thief? Did you steal the bread? He says, sir, I've been unemployed for six months now. I've, I've sold all my goods. I've sold everything I own. Uh, my wife can't work because she's unwell. And the judge looked at him and said, listen, did you steal the bread? And that makes you a thief. He says, sir, I have done everything I can to find work, but I can't find work. Finally, the judge looks at him and said, did you steal the bread? If you did, that makes you a thief. The man cast down his head and then he looked up at the judge and he goes, yes, sir, I'm a thief. I stole the bread. And the judge said, okay, I'm going to fine you $100. And with that, The judge pulls out his wallet, pays the $100, looks at the thief and says, 
any time you and your family are hungry, you come to my place and you can dine at my table. You see, what the judge was looking for was he's looking for some honesty. He was looking for some ownership of what has gone on here. He wasn't looking for minimization, rationalization, or a self made sanctification. Because that's what we can end up doing when we rationalize away our, our marriage vows. These marriage vows are designed to be covenant, but greater than covenant is the power of the cross. Greater than anything that we have done is the power that Jesus brings to us in this whole conversation of truth and grace. You see, Jesus says that if you marry somebody, again, and there hasn't been adultery involved, then that is called, sorry, if there hasn't been, uh, yeah, essentially adultery, it hasn't been uh, marital unfaithfulness. He says you commit adultery in that first instance. You are remarried, there's no doubt about that. But at that point, you need to discover the grace of God. And the problem with this is that we often in Christian circles go looking for the grace without addressing the truth. The truth is what Jesus said. We can't deny that. And one of the biggest challenges that we face with this whole thing of grace is this, and it's really hard to get our heads around, is that God took an awfully big risk by pronouncing grace ahead of time. These are words quoted from Philip Yancey. You see, even in the context of a broken broken marriage where it is slowly eroding and becoming worse and worse for all the effort that's being put into it, we can still look at the end result and say, this isn't the unpardonable sin. Which doesn't now open the door for everybody to run through a divorce every time the toast is burned. But it says when we have felt the weight of that covenant, when we've bore the burden of a broken relationship, when we have looked down the barrel and said, God, the only way through this, and I can't handle loneliness, I still burn with the passion of youth, I still desire to have a relationship, there is something in there for me in the future, a restoration of bringing male and female together. And God says, yes, my grace is sufficient for you. That is the only way to reconcile what is going on. We don't try to reconcile everything else that we do without going through the cross. But funny enough, in marriage, and even in Christian circles, we seem to rationalize, legitimize, minimize, justify all of what's gone on in the previous relationship as if that is going to allow us to be forgiven without going by way of the cross. Does that make sense? The cross is still the only legitimate way, even in the context of a broken relationship, to get ourselves right with God Because once we get right with God, we learn how to be single again. You need to be whole and complete to actually be able to be single so that you can put yourself in a position to be healed, so that you can put yourself in a position to ideally, maybe, not ideally, but to to be married again. But that means that grace is given even in the context of the, 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 the difficulty of that relationship. We know that this is not the unpardonable sin. We just, what Jesus wanted us to do was to feel the absolute weight of that covenant and what it means. So at the end of the day, grace wins. Grace wins. But not without avoiding truth. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted us to do. To be able to look at marriage in its entirety for all that it means for society and for those individuals, for all that God designed it to be, for the, for the fact that marriage is and always will be God's plan and God's desire so that we can be a people, who, even in the brokenness of a broken relationship, we can be restored through the cross of Christ. Let's stand for prayer. Father, indeed, many of us here have been deeply affected by broken relationships. Marriages that have been persevered with, worked on, challenged over by so many different ways, and yet they've come to an end. And I know, Lord, that for many here, that means that they've felt the weight and the burden and the absolute anguish and pain of seeing 
two people separated and hurt and defined by that broken relationship. And Lord, you're in the process of restoring people even now as we talk. All of this to say, Lord, not that we avoid the cross, not that we avoid confession, not that we avoid seeing what Jesus said and the profound weight of all that he put back upon the Pharisees and us when he put marriage in that proper place again. And yet through it all, Lord, we see the cross. And we're grateful, Lord, that the cross supersedes all of human wrongs, all of human indifference, all of human pain and the struggle and the suffering. And there we can find ourselves made complete and whole to be able to be resurrected as a complete person once again. And so God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Maybe in the heat of this moment, feel some of that pain of the past. I pray that you be the God who soothes their soul, reminds them, reminds them that they are loved and can never be separated from that love. And for those of us who aren't married, Lord, I pray that you help us feel the weight of what that covenant is really about and not to walk haphazardly into it, but indeed to look with sober judgment at the decisions that we make concerning marriage so that always you will be Lord over these circumstances. We ask all of this 